Welcome to Prime Life. We call it Retirement 2.0. Leave each episode with tips and new ideas to help you navigate retirement in our new age. It's your time. Make it count. This podcast is for educational purposes only. It is not intended as medical, investment, or financial advice. We do not sponsor or endorse any of the individuals, companies, products, or services featured on this podcast. Any statements or opinions expressed are of the individual who makes them. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone. This is Joseph Katz, and welcome to another episode of the Prime Life Podcast. I'm excited to be here today with my co-host, Mary. How are you doing today? Joseph, I am doing pretty, pretty good uh, because I'm here with you, and uh, we have a very cool guest that I'm excited to introduce. Oh, we're going to get into some pretty interesting content today. There's no question. So why don't you introduce our guest, and uh, let's dive in. Absolutely. So today we have Charles Rodenkirk, PhD. He's a leader in brain computer interfaces, neuromodulation, and the neuroscience underlying perception. I know that's a lot. That's a mouthful. He is the CEO of Sharper Sense, which was made possible by his doctoral research at Columbia University. Charles, tell us a little bit about yourself and Sharper Sense. And thank you for joining us here at Prime Life Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me today and happy to talk a little bit about myself and definitely excited to share about what we're working on with Sharper Sense and uh, how that might help the listeners in the future uh, today. So uh, my background is in biomedical engineering and computer science. I grew up in Wisconsin, did my undergrad there and came out to New York City to uh, pursue research in brain computer interfaces. I really wanted to uh, use electronics to interface with biology and what is a more exciting target than the brain. Uh, and what we've been working on in the last uh, almost decade now is using these interfaces to develop technology we call neuromodulation, or some people also call bioelectronic medicine. And the idea is, instead of using a pharmaceutical drug to drive a benefit in the brain, you can use electrical energy, uh, the natural language of the brain, to activate regions and drive a similar benefit. And with Sharper Sense, we're developing neuromodulation technology that enhances the clarity of your senses. Think clearer hearing, vision, and touch. And we do this by using electrical stimulation to activate neural circuitry that's responsible for naturally enhancing these senses when you're more attentive and alert. So I think Mary and I already got a bachelor's now in neuromodulation from that first you know, 60 seconds. Uh, Charles, I met you at an event a month or so ago. And you were talking about uh, how this neuromodulation can help with hearing loss. And we've spoken on this show about how hearing loss, you know, potentially leads to, you know, not great outcomes, right? So it speeds up uh, aging in, in various ways, potentially uh, uh, as it comes to, you know, your brain and the brain's health and so forth. So maybe talk a little bit about what the impact is and, and how and why this is so relevant to uh, an older an older adult audience. Yeah, happy to talk about that. So uh, as we started to translate this technology out of the lab, we were looking for what's the most important application we can use it for first. Lots of uses for enhancing performance or safety across a variety of tasks or positions. Uh, but when we talked to older adults, we had the most uh, reliable problem and the more we dug into it, we found out how large and painful it is, which is hearing loss. Um, and of course, we're all familiar with the fact that your age impairs your ears, damages the receptors, makes it harder for them to encode audio. Uh, but something we've been learning a lot about recently is how the age also impairs the brain's ability to clearly process sensory information from your ears. Um, and that is something that sharper sense can uniquely address, whereas existing technologies like hearing aids do not. And as we looked into this problem more, uh, there is a further link between hearing loss and the brain. And, and that's what recent research has shown that even mild hearing loss, if left untreated, doubles your risk of dementia. Uh, so there's gonna be a lot of push now across the next decades to improve our hearing care, make sure you get treatment earlier to try to break that risk. 
So that's amazing. I did not realize that at all. And so can you talk a little bit about how sharper sense is different than you said, like hearing aids or I don't know, I'm going to throw the pharmaceutical term out there because I'm sure individuals are thinking who are listeners are thinking, wow, oh, I didn't realize maybe I have some hearing loss. Like, you know, what's the mechanism that I should be moving toward or who who do I call? Who do I talk to? Like, I know we have doctors and so uh, that's an obvious thing, but like my mind is swirling around with like, I didn't realize all of these options and I didn't realize there was technology that could really make significant improvements. And we'll get that answer after a brief word from our commercial sponsors. NASA is always working harder to be your carrier of choice. We offer insurance products that can help you meet your retirement goals, such as protecting your savings, securing lifetime income, or paying for health care costs. We're dedicated to providing best-in-class service and are keeping things simple, and we'll have your back. We have around 400,000 policyholders and contract holders, and have been doing this for a long time, 170 years. But we remain humble enough to always try to improve. For more information, visit nfg.com. NASA insurance products are issued by NASA Life and Annuity Company of Hartford, Connecticut. NASA Life Insurance Company, East Greenbush, New York, or NASA Life Insurance Company of Kansas, Overland Park, Kansas. Subsidiaries of NASA Financial Group, products are not available in all areas. Policyholder counts are for all NASA companies as of September 30th, 2022, and are subject to change. Coverite is the first digital concierge health insurance platform focused on Medicare. Their mission is to make Medicare more transparent and accessible for America's 60 million Medicare beneficiaries. By simplifying a traditionally confusing and complex decision, Coverite delivers a simple, seamless, and hassle-free plan selection and enrollment experience. Try the Coverite platform and see for yourself why they've been referred to as the TurboTax for Medicare. Visit Coverite.com slash podcast to learn more. Yeah, happy to talk about that. So we're not on market yet. We're just wrapped up a pilot clinical study that had positive results. So hopefully we'll be on market in the near future. Uh, but right now, hearing aids will drive a benefit right away. So our technology is complementary to hearing aids, and we recommend that everyone uh, who has any type of measurable hearing loss look into getting hearing aids because studies have shown that by treating this hearing loss earlier uh, with whatever means you have available uh, can help break that link between impaired hearing and dementia. Uh, and we're hopeful that uh, you know we can add on to what hearing aids are doing, which is amplifying the audio to make sure your ears receive that uh, sound by making sure the brain is in the right state to clearly understand it. Uh, I think you guys are likely familiar with the fact that if we're in a crowded room, you would notice that you're focusing on my voice and how that becomes clearer over the background noise. A lot of what my original research was looking at is how is the brain inducing that clarity into this audio signal? What's happening there? And what's interesting is as you get older, it's harder to do that. It takes more effort to have this intentional enhancement. And we're hopeful that our technology can be worn in combination with the hearing aids to uh, provide a more holistic benefit by treating both the damage in the ear and this impairment in the brain. So you mentioned your research, maybe just give us a little bit more of the backstory, like what led to your interest and the research and, and how this all come to be, because it's super interesting. I, we've talked a lot about neuroscience and you know how the brain can learn and, is, and, and evolve. So like maybe talk a little bit about how this all started for you. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of it uh, was directed initially by my co-founder, Professor Chi Wang, who runs Columbia's Neural Engineering Lab. And his lab has a mission to develop ways of an enhancing and restoring brain function. And to do this, we thought one way would be to understand how the brain naturally enhances its performance. Uh, it was a very well-documented mechanism that when you're more attentive, more alert, your senses become more clear. Uh, so we used a rodent model to understand what's responsible for that. There's these neuromodulatory regions in your brain that control levels of neurochemicals, and they influence how your brain processes information. We figured out the right one to increase to drive this effect on demand. And we started this research 
you know, six, seven, eight years of research in animals, first at Columbia, and now the last couple of years we've been testing in human subjects where we're using non-invasive stimulation, sending an electrical field through the skin, comfortable level that activates a nerve that projects into the brain, allows us to activate this in what will eventually be a wearable patch. Think something like a nicotine patch, but instead of having drugs inside this patch, we have a little battery, a little electric field generator, and this delivers current through electrodes that are on the surface of your skin. That's interesting. It seems like, again, this is a general statement, but I've seen other uses of the patch. Like I know as it relates, it seems like to diabetes and to different things. So it just seems like there's more of a trend to that. But I'm really interested if you could share a little bit about uh, regenerative treatments for the inner ear. What does that mean? And like, what does that look like? Yeah. And this is something we're interested in uh, as we look at what is going to be the future of hearing care and seeing how sharper sense could play in this space. Um, and that's that there are uh, many treatments in development right now that have the potential to restore the receptors in the ear, um, whether that's injections with stem cells or different vectors that allow for uh, changes or addressing of damage to the ear over time. Um, and we think that will be a very interesting time point as we address this damage to the ear, it will bring even more focus on to what's going on in the brain. Um, and even day today, a lot of uh, hearing aid users say, you know, I have no problem hearing the sound, it's making sense of the speech over the noise that's difficult for us. Um, and so we're very curious to see how that develops over time. Um, and it's true hearing aids aren't a complete solution right now. Uh, one in four hearing aid users still struggles with speech and noise. So uh, we're looking for both ways to improve that damage to the ear as well as improve your brain's ability to clearly understand sound. Is there an age when people start experiencing that problem? Like, because I, a long time, if I'm in a crowded spot with a lot of noise, I can't hear anything. I, like, and my hearing is pretty good. I can hear everything, you know, in a quiet, non, you know, noisy environment. Is it something that happens as you age? Is it individual? Like, some people just handle those situations better than others. I'm just curious how that might work. Yeah. So, uh, of course, there's quite a variation over uh, individuals, and, and some people are fortunate enough to make it to old age with still good hearing, but that's a very small fraction of the population. Um, by the time you turn 65, uh, one in four people will have hearing loss, and once you hit 75, that's about half of people, and that percentage just keeps going up over time. Um, and so that's people that, that we think are very motivated to get this treatment due to the link between hearing loss and dementia. Uh, but interestingly, um, as we do more research, we're finding this uh, speech comprehension over noise isn't just an older adult problem. Uh, the CDC did a survey and they found 21% of adults over the age of 18 in the U.S. struggle with this. No, that's interesting. Again, I didn't ever think about that. But I am really interested because I'm a sports person. Um, I noticed that you said something in your notes to us about athletes. And uh, this technology can help, you know, in a sports related way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, at a high level, what we're doing is uh, enhancing the clarity of your senses. This means less misperceptions, less miscommunication. And so when we think about athletes who are trying to be at the top of their game, uh, not only do they need sharp vision, uh, tactile feedback, but they're often communicating with teammates as well. Uh, so we think that long term, uh, there's potential for our technology to have a large impact in that space. And we did it an accelerator with a Comcast NBC Sports Text, so have some partnerships already. Um, and although we're very focused on older adults first, uh, we want to develop a technology that older adults can feel cool wearing. So, uh, you know, this is performance enhancement. They shouldn't have to feel like uh, it's a badge of a uh, disability. And by doing things like partnering with these athletes as we roll this technology out, uh, we can let older adults use something that's uh, coming out of, you know, testing in NASCAR instead of uh, traditional development lines. And it's a little bit more cool to wear. Actually, let's just continue that thought about you know, how long, you know, this product coming out to market. What does that look like in terms of timeline, right? Because medical, medical devices, you know, tend to be many years. You've been working on this, you said, I think eight or nine years. It, is this going through the um, federal process? Is it like going to be over the counter? Like, what does that look like? 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, looking at the whole lifespan, uh, it's been certainly been something very interesting to me to learn as we go through it. And uh, if you think about neuromodulation, it's a lot like developing a pharmaceutical in a way. So there was a lot of initial work in animals trying to find, you know, what are we targeting and how do we want to change that activity to drive this benefit? Um, and then once we felt that in animals, we tested out the safety of it, confirmed no side effects, and then we moved into a, a human model. So the last couple of years, we've been doing what they call pilot clinical studies, which are small scale tests uh, measuring our ability to enhance senses. Well, with very you know, well-regulated experiments uh, controlled with shams and using computational systems to measure your sensory acuity, uh, basically the world's most boring video games that measure your uh, vision and hearing. Um, and now that we can show an improvement on there, we'll be getting ready for what would be a, a pivotal clinical trial uh, that we can use the results from to seek clearance from the FDA. Uh, so long term, we hope to get FDA clearance to treat symptoms of age related hearing loss, and then we could be sold both over the counter and as well as via prescription. Kind of quick follow up before Mary jumps in. Will a doctor have to prescribe this? Or I mean, I'm over the counter not, but you know, is it going to, you yeah. have to go to some sort of like an audiologist to get it or? So the hearing care space is a little bit interesting because uh, you have multiple different types of uh, practitioners and clinicians. Um, our technology hopefully will be able to be available both via prescription from uh, someone like an ENT, a ears, nose, throat doctor, uh, as well as over the counter from audiologist or uh, hearing aid dispensers. So why do you believe that, you know, checking hearing is not done perhaps as often as it should be um, once, you know, whether it's, whether someone has a complaint that they're not hearing as well, especially in, you know, crowded rooms or whatever, wh why do you think that's the case? Because with other um, parts of our body, if you will, we have certain time frames, you know, regular checkups that we uh, hopefully, uh, you know, take care of. And this one doesn't seem for me any way to fit. So how, how do you, you know, what would you say about that? Yeah, it's kind of an unusual uh, thing that we've learned as we've dug into this space, uh, which is that most individuals have hearing tests in the early years uh, when they're in school, uh, many times when they're still in employment. Um, and then as soon as they, you know, oftentimes retire, they stop getting hearing tests at what is likely the most critical time for them to be monitoring this effect. Um, and uh, one of the, our advisors, uh, his name is Professor Frank Lynn. He's at Johns Hopkins. He's one of the leading key opinion leaders uh, in this hearing space. And uh, this is certainly one of his talking points that I'll, I'll take here, but that this hearing testing is very important and for multiple reasons um, and should likely be done much more frequently. Um, there's a lot of uh, lobbying going right now to try to include hearing tests in Medicare, and I am strongly a proponent of that. Um, two reasons why it's so important to keep track of. Uh, one is that as soon as you start seeing a deficit, you should start treating. Um, if you don't treat it early on, it's been shown that when you try to treat it later, this creates a, a odd, uh, uncomfortable period when you use hearing aids for the first time, it starts putting audio through these pathways in your brain that have actually started to generate. So if you don't use this hearing, it'll degenerate away, which means that uh, you need to ideally get hearing aids as soon as you might need a benefit. Uh, but the other uh, reason to monitor this closely as well is that this impairment with hearing is highly linked with uh, dementia. So uh, there's been a lot of studies that show that if you start having impaired hearing, that greatly increases your risks of cognitive decline in the coming years. Um, and it's really a indicator to start paying a lot of attention to these things. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's also a correlation to loneliness, which also leads to other problems, right? Because if you can't hear, you sort of withdraw from your social circles to some extent. Yeah, exactly. So there's two uh, you know, links between hearing loss and uh, cognitive decline that people are studying. And at first is the one you mentioned that people develop these unhealthy coping mechanisms. They say, uh, you know, I enjoyed that brunch with my friends, but that restaurant is too noisy. I'm just going to stop going. Or, uh, you know, I love to be on that group call, but the audio through the internet is so noisy. You know, I don't need that. Uh, and over time, they start to cut out the social engagement in your life that is really uh, critical for the healthy aging. Um, and 
there's even some audiologists that will tell older adults that they should be doing the exact opposite. You should actually be forcing yourself to go into challenging environments, basically working out your mind uh, somewhat like a muscle here in the auditory processing. Uh, and then the other link is, uh, it seems through more recent research that some of the systems in the brain that become impaired uh, that cause this decline in cognitive function are also some of the systems that support uh, sensory processing and, and their impairment might also uh, cause a deficit there. Um, so a very intertwined story. Um, the takeaway there is that the earlier you can treat it, uh, the less you can uh, make that correlation. But you said something earlier that was interesting about, you know, kids getting hearing tests, but as you age almost, I can't even tell you the last time I, someone even offered me a hearing test. Like it, it, you know, and I'm definitely going towards the second, second, uh, <laughs> what's the, what's the word I'm looking for, but you, you get where I'm going here. Right. And, uh, I can't tell you the last time I had a hearing test. No one's even asked me if my hearing is okay. They just, you go into a checkup, they do ask you 10 questions and you're out yeah. the door. So it's, it's good to hear, no pun intended, that, uh, there are people working on trying to incorporate hearing tests into, you know, greater medical coverages. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about your, your business and, and where you are now. What's, you know, you're a scientist, you know, you know doctor of neuro, <laughs> neuropathy. I can't even pronounce it anymore. Biomedical engineering, but yeah. Bio, yeah okay. There you go. Um, what's been the most surprising? Now an ad from one of our sponsors. Remember when you could trust the news? Well, then check out Walter. Walter is the free, no-nonsense newsletter for grown-ups that comes to your inbox three times a week. From current trends, aging in place, travel, retirement, and everything in between, including a dash of pop culture trivia and throwbacks, Walter is a great way to start your mornings and to stay informed. Oh, and did we mention that it's free? Check us out at thisiswalter.com. Get smart. Get Walter finding you've had through this process of, of building this company? Yeah, I think um, certainly there's been surprises all along the way. Um, and I think, you know, honestly, one of the things we found more surprising was finding out how uh, large a problem hearing loss is. I mean, I'm a younger adult myself. I, I, my ears work perfectly well. So it's not something I've spent much time looking into and still we, until we started looking at uh, applications for this technology, where are people struggling with vision and hearing? Um, and that's when we really found out that speech and noise is such a difficulty. Um, and there's a lot of things that aren't so obvious on the surface to a younger adult about why this is a painful problem. Of course, there's the obvious, uh, you know, inability to communicate, which is by itself hard enough. Um, but, you know, talking to older adults and learning about things, you know, one thing I've heard a lot is sometimes older adults will get labeled as having dementia even or cognitive decline when it's just a hearing loss. You know, they'll have someone say, oh, they didn't remember something. Well, it's not that they just didn't hear it the first time or they reply incorrectly uh, because they misheard something and they, it seems like they don't know what's going on, but it's just a hearing issue. Um, and these types of instances, even in a one-off situation, can change a relationship between an older adult and someone else uh, forever, you know, change the way they treat them. Um, and I found that, you know, pretty sad and something that we can really uh, hope to try to improve better. And, you know, the more we think about this, using sharper sense to help with speech recognition, sometimes I, I think, uh, you know, maybe a superpower that uh, hasn't been used yet is the ability to have everyone understand what you're saying, right? Is that, you know, is so important and useful in conversation. And as you get older, uh, this is something that becomes difficult on both sides of the conversation. And uh, hopefully sharper sense can help with that issue. I love what you just said about, you know, the sensitivity about, you know, understanding that if someone is not hearing what you're saying, how that could change a relationship or, you know, could change the way someone treats you. And I think, you know, as we all get older, you know, even I have found that it is interesting to see, um, you know, my, my, my thing is I'm wearing, like, I'm going to continue wearing colors because I need to show up that way. And it, I never thought about as it relates to hearing, can this technology help individuals that have are, are unable to hear at all? 
Yeah, so of course there are some limits for our technology. And if, if you're not getting any type of audio signals of the brain, we're not going to be able to improve the processing. Uh, that being said, for individuals that have impairment in the ears already and are getting a limited signal to the brain, uh, it's our theory that that becomes even more important to process that signal that you are getting correctly. This, this is a super interesting conversation for so many different pathways here. You mentioned lobbying before. I know a lot of established medical lobbyists don't like new technology. Uh, have you found the existing technologies, whether it be hearing aids or other hearing solutions, uh, fighting what you're doing or are you getting support from them? And, you know, kind of what have you seen just put in, bring this thing to, to market? I know you're still a little bit away from market, but. Yeah. So, uh, if any hearing aid manufacturers are listening right now, we'd love to talk because, uh, given our technology is complementary, uh, we're hopeful that we can partner with hearing aids. Um, it is a somewhat interesting marketplace where you have uh, uh, six large hearing aid uh, companies dominating it as a, largely a monopoly. Um, and in the past, this has uh, resulted in some other, uh, let's say, new hearing aid startups having a little bit of difficulty breaking into the space. Um, from our interviews with older adults, uh, most hearing aid purchasers will take their audiologist recommendation. So, you know, who has the ear of the audiologist is uh, oftentimes uh, what technology that's being led to uh, adoption. Uh, of course, these audiologists know what they're doing. So uh, I think that is oftentimes the right choice. Um, and from our early conversation with the audiologist, they're really excited to adopt something like Sharper Sense, where, you know, instead of saying, hey, we can offer you know, marginal improvements, but require you switching up your entire uh, supply chain, uh, we instead can say, we can address a problem that your hearing aids can't and, and solve problems for the hearing aids, help them with things like uh, performance in noisy situations, as well as this break-in period that occurs during the start of your hearing aid. Um, and so in that way, we hope to be able to forge partnerships and be a friendly entrant to this market. I don't know if everyone got it, but you said the ear of the audiologist. I, uh, I got that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, I want to give Mary the, the final question here today. But uh, this has been super, super, super interesting. Uh, and uh, so I'll hand it over to Mary for our final question of the day. So, Charles, you're super smart. You're well-educated. You could do really whatever you want. Why do you wake up every day and decide this is what you want to focus on? What's your why? Yeah, so, uh, you know, first it's easy to wake up and we're working on such exciting things. So there's always, a, you know, something interesting to dig into. And I think, uh, you know, we chose this first target application of helping older adults with this technology largely uh, due to uh, capitalistic reasons because we feel like it's a good market. But uh, the more we work towards it, uh, I also have a great sense of feeling like we are on a right target where we can do a lot of benefit for a lot of different people if this technology is successful. And, and that certainly uh, really helps with us uh, getting up on the early days and uh, staying up late and nights on the lab. Um, and you know, when you take a step back and look at what's going to be happening in the coming decades, I was recently at a conference and I overheard uh, someone say that for kids born after 2020, there's a 50% chance they'll live to the age of 100. Um, and that, you know, at first glance is a really exciting, it's a wonderful thought, um, but it also opens up a very interesting question of, you know, what are we going to do with what will be a much larger older adult population in the future? Um, you know, right now we have people retiring at 65 or 60, you, you know, Will they, if they're living to 100, that's quite a long time to be retired. So we're going to see things like older adults have to work longer, of course, with the reward of having a much longer life. Um, so technology like ours helping in the hearing loss space, things like that will be critical for helping these older adults uh, basically extend what we are now calling a healthy aging period, instead of just tacking on these uh, years of longevity to the end of life that aren't the same kind of uh, high quality, enjoyable experience that people want. Doing well by doing good. I love it. Uh, there is so much to unpack and people should definitely go visit your website. So why don't you tell us the best way for people to learn more about yourself, Sharper Sense, and uh, how to get in touch with you. Yeah, so our website's live at www.sharpersense.com. Uh, there's a contact us form on there. So we monitor that and are happy to talk to anyone that reaches out. And 
Uh, if you are in the New York City area, we are uh, recruiting test participants for older adults as well as doing demos of the technology to get early feedback. So we'd love to hear from you. Oh, that's a great offer. I wish I'd have led with that one. You buried the lead there, Charles. Uh, everyone you know, should definitely take a look at the website. Uh, if you know someone or you yourself have some sort of hearing impairment, this is uh, really an interesting technology and uh, the future, the future is here. So uh, Charles, thank you again for your time, your insights, your, your research and your and the scientific study. Mary, for your presence and great questions. Thank you all. Until next week, have a great week, everyone. And tune in again for another episode of the Prime Life Podcast. Thanks for having me. Remember to subscribe to the Prime Life Podcast anywhere you find podcasts. You can find all of our episodes, contact information, and more on our website, primelifepodcast.com. Stay connected with us. Follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok.